So I'm going to give you a brief introduction on IR spectroscopy. Really not much more than you've already seen, but give you a little more idea about why signals look the way they look and where you expect to find signals for different kinds of compounds or functional groups. Um, you notice I told you to do, when there's multi-part questions, I told you to do all of them because you just basically, you need a lot of practice. I, uh, I, my, under, my application of IR spectroscopy is not as theoretical as most. Um, my preference is to use spectroscopy to help me understand what molecule I have. And somebody asked me, how do you know where all these peaks are? And I say, well, I don't. I see a spectrum, and I recognize a functional group. And they looked at me all mystified, and I said to them, do you have a cat or a dog? Do you have a dog? Yes. You have a dog. How do you know it's your dog? Uh, or legs and parts. And you'll look at it, and it's your dog, right? That's how you're going to recognize, for example, carboxylic acids. You'll see something on the screen and go, oh, that's a dog. And you're not going to remember all like exactly where the wave numbers are, but it is important to have an understanding about why they are where they're at so that you can identify functional groups and variations of functional groups. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, just really quickly, just spectroscopy, okay, we're used to looking at the visible spectrum. So here's the visible spectrum. Did it already disconnect on me? It already disconnected on me. Yeah, it's still recording, though. So in spectroscopy, we're looking at the visible spectrum. That's in this range here. Uh, for what we call visible spectroscopy, then we have UV-vis spectroscopy. What ranges are we looking in? What's UV, right? We'd be looking in these ultraviolet ranges, and infrared is over here on this part of the spectrum. The wavelengths go from about, this is about 700 nanometers. 1,000 nanometers would be one micrometer, right? So the infrared spectrum is really from about one micrometer to about 50 micrometers, okay? Ballpark. <coughs> Uh, most of what we're going to be looking at is in this infrared range that we're talking about here. Now, the wavelengths are funny, so we, I'll talk about that, but you guys are already familiar with the concept of wave numbers. We just figure out how many waves are in each centimeter. There's an equation for doing it, but that's, you don't really need to know the equation. It's just the number of waves per centimeter. Okay. The common types of spectroscopy besides mass spectroscopy and Mass spectroscopy doesn't rely on photons. It relies on particles of, like, fragments of molecules. So it doesn't actually classify the same as spectroscopy as, like, the ones we're going to talk about here. We're going to be using, for the most part, these top two, infrared spectroscopy. And infrared spectroscopy, the information it gives us, it gives us a lot of information about functional groups. So what do I mean by functional groups? Is there an alcohol? Is there an ether? Is there a carboxylic acid? Is there an aldehyde, a ketone, an alkene, an alkyne, amides, nitriles? If, if you have any of those functional groups, it's like looking at a different species of animal and going cat, dog, bird, chicken, right? There's not a, there are quantifiable things about a cat you got the little whiskers and the little pointy ears, and it purrs. And, things. and that's basically what you're going to be doing when you do spectroscopy. Now, the other one that we'll do is nuclear magnetic resonance. And that uses actually radio waves. So if you go back to this spectrum here, radio waves are way down in here. So they're very long wavelengths. Uh, radio waves can be meters long, but we're not talking that kind of radio waves. But they can be pretty long. And the instrument we have, the NMR, is closely related to, is actually the predecessor for the magnetic resonance imaging. If 
you guys you know what MRIs are for like di medical diagnostic, an MRI is essentially a two-dimensional NMR or a three-dimensional NMR, okay? And it relies on the magnetic properties of hydrogens, and water has a lot of hydrogen on it, right, per, per mole, and we are able to detect water molecules using NMR. Okay, and the last one is, uh, oh yeah, sorry, so what does, it, what does it do? It tells us how atoms are arranged next to each other. It gives us like spatial information on the molecule. So if you know what functional groups you have and you know the spatial arrangement, you can generally reconstruct what the structure of the compound is. Now, very few people actually do spectroscopy um, at any level, really, where they have complete unknowns. Okay? So, like, it would be horrible if every lab you came into, you, I said to you, okay, you have some reagents, mix them together, and then make a product. I don't know what it is. Figure it out. <laughs> Nobody, hardly anybody in a laboratory does that anymore. It's usually, oh, I'm starting with this molecule, right? Like a carboxylic acid. And then I'm going to make, like you did with the banana oil, and an alcohol. And I'm making an ester out of it. Let's see if we got an ester. So you actually know what to look for in most spectroscopies these days, OK? You will have a project, however, later in the semester where I give you a bunch of unknowns. We don't do a reaction. And I just say, well, what is it? And you have to figure it out, OK? That, that's just more, it's fun, actually. It's like a puzzle, OK? So you'll take your IR information. You'll take your NMR information. NMR actually can be done in multiple different ways. One way is you can look at hydrogen atoms. Another way, you can look at carbon atoms. You can look at the relationship in space of the hydrogen atoms, relationship in space of the carbon atoms. You can put a lot of information together. Now, some of the fancier techniques, you make two-dimensional maps, and you can trace out like the connections of the carbons on the map, and so you know which groups are next to which groups. So maybe we'll get to that. Uh, just a little bit about why this works. Uh, but not a lot of details about why it works. Do you guys remember atoms have electrons and they're in energy levels? And then w when you put a photon into it, what happens? The electron jumps to higher energy level. OK, and we, we say that it's quantized, that there are energy levels or states like n equals 1, n equals 2. S, P, and D also correlate to quantized energy levels. Turns out there are lots of things that are quantized. If you use um, here we go infrared, right? What you end up doing down in here, these very lowest energy transitions, a molecule will have a ground state energy. The thing about that, there's Atoms have ground state energies because the electrons are the lowest energy levels. When molecules are formed, their atomic orbitals create new molecular orbitals, and those molecular orbitals have low energy states. And as you excite the molecule by putting <clears throat> photons into it, these low energy states begin to absorb energy, and as they go from one energy level, they can go to another energy level. Okay. Turns out vibrations are quantized. So like the movement of the molecule and rotation of molecules is quantized. So it turns out like everything that we've studied basically is quantized. If you put energy into it, some sort of photon of the right wavelength, you can go from a ground state to an excited state. So let's say you're at your ground state vibrational energy level. What do you think you're probably doing at ground state? The absolute ground state. Are you vibrating? If you're at the very ground state, you're not moving at all. all right? And then I go to the next higher level, and then what happens? Absorb a photon, then I'll start moving. And there's all kinds of ways. We'll talk a little bit about the ways they can vibrate. Um, and, and that's what infrared spectroscopy does. Um, it turns out 
in uh, visible and ultraviolet spectroscopy, you're typically taking conjugated pi bond electrons and moving them to higher energy levels, and that gives us color, right, and the appearance of color, at least. So, like I said, rotation, vibration, there's a lot of different things that are quantized. In infrared spectroscopy, we're just looking at the absorption of infrared light and how it changes the vibration of molecules. Okay? A little bit of a schematic, and I stole these actually from a Caltech website. <clears throat> but I stole this diagram because I thought it was pretty nice. Ultraviolet can result in breaking of bonds. Infrared is vibration of molecules, like the movement of the atoms that are connected by bonds. And it kind of makes sense because infrared is lower energy than ultraviolet. So rather than breaking the bonds, it just shakes the bonds. Okay. And then there's microwave. What do we use microwave for? Heating food, right? Microwave radiation results in the absorption of micro well, microwave oven uses microwave radiation, the molecule absorbs it and then goes into different ro uh, rotational energy states. As the molecules rotate, right, they start to rub against each other, that creates friction and then they heat up. Okay? So that's actually how a microwave makes your food hot. It causes molecules to start, water molecules in particular, to start spinning around very fast and as they rotate around they generate heat and that's what heats the food up. Okay? So, how we collect a spectrum, and we'll go right into this. Uh, you guys know this already, I think, because we've done it in um, the lab, okay? And most of you are in the lab, but just in case, right? What we do is, in our instrument, we collect a background spectrum. And the background spectrum is everything in the instrument, okay? It includes gases, so you could see CO2 in those, you can see... Uh, water vapor, these all have infrared absorptions that are pretty strong, but those things will show up in the background spectrum. We're not interested in those things, and so what we do next is we put a sample on it, and the sample becomes part of the instrument. And as the infrared light is, is reflected off the sample, we measure the amount of light that's absorbed and then convert that to a percentage of the original light that was uh, brought in. Um, you could... The actual instrument we have is called an ATR, and you could think of it like this. Here's the top side of the IR plate. There's a little disc in here, and you've seen the little disc, right, when you put your sample on there. A little tiny circle that goes underneath the anvil or the thing that goes on the top, that's actually made out of diamond, okay? You can make them out of... KBR. You can make them out of other materials like there's a selenium oxide that people use. There's a bunch of different things you could make it out of. Um, but diamond doesn't dissolve very easily. So that's, I mean, we had a group of students a year ago actually break one <laughs> because what they did is they dissolved the adhesive that was around the diamond by leaving like basically concentrated hydrochloric acid on it and then left it closed and it just ate its way down. And the next thing you know, when you put a sample on there, it would leak into the bottom. I'm like, how's the sample getting inside the ATR module? I don't yeah, anyways, it was a pain. Uh, the company fixed it. They said that shouldn't happen, but it happened. So that's why I tell you guys, like, every time you use it to clean it, right? Because it has happened. You can destroy a diamond ATR, it turns out. Okay, so there's the piece of diamond. It's actually got a little window on it. So it's shaped approximately like that. We use an infrared laser, and the infrared laser bounces up into here and then bounces back down and then goes to a detector. So we pass infrared radiation onto that sample, uh, dim that diamond, without a sample, and then we just stick a sample on it. And it turns out, you guys probably don't get to think about this very often, if you take light and you shine it on the back side of a glass surface. You know how it kind of glows right there? Right? And especially like a laser. What that actually means is that there's a little bit of a photo, there's a little bit of a 
energy that's leaking up through the diamond surface or glass surface. That light, right, can be absorbed by a sample. So if you put a sample up here, that light gets absorbed by the sample. So it doesn't actually have to be directly in the path of the light. It's called an evanescent wave. And it's what you see, essentially, when you shine light at an incident angle to a piece of glass. You see a little bit of glow above it. That's the light that's being absorbed. Okay. Okay, so pretty simple. We take a background. We take a sample plus the background. We do subtraction, and we get the sample spectrum. Convert it to a percentage. It looks something like this. Okay. Again, this is the percentage of the incident light that's absorbed. Uh, when you did this kind of stuff in Chem uh, 1A or 1B, you converted it to an absorbance, but we typically do it as a transmittance. 100% okay, means all the light's getting through. Nothing's being absorbed at that wavelength. Okay? And then 0% down here means it's all being absorbed. Okay? We don't necessarily want to have it go to zero because this, all we're looking at is the relative size of the peaks. So, so let's say I did a lower concentration or got less material on the diamond plate when I did my infrared spectrum. What do you think that spectrum would look like? Like got less on there. It looks like it'd be shifted up, but you can't go above 100%. So like if you had less sample on there, it might look something like that, okay? It just gets a smaller signal. That's why it's, you gotta be a little bit careful on our ATR modules. I don't think they're supposed to do this, but if you turn it really tight, you can actually squeeze liquid samples, get squeezed out of there, and then the signal gets really tiny, so you have to be careful. If you have liquid samples, the other thing you have to worry about is what? Evaporation. So if you like try to, you can try this, try to do methylene chloride. That's the one I, guys, I showed you guys in the lab, right? I had to be really quick about put the methylene chloride in, close it down, because if you don't, it, by the time, if you take your time, it's gone. Later this semester, we're going to be dealing with stuff that's as volatile, if not more volatile, than methylene chloride. And students will often put the drop on, and by the time they screw the top down, it's gone. They're like, I didn't get a spectrum. I'm like, because you turned the knob too slow. <laughs> you should have gotten a spectrum, but you just turned the knob too slow. And to make it worse, because they're so volatile, our percent recoveries are very low. So you just have this tiny, tiny sample, and then you're trying to get it on there, and you're trying to not have it evaporate. We're going to try to do the index of refraction on it, too. So you have to do a bunch of techniques where you expose it to air, and it always disappears. Anyways. Or alkyl halides, if you know what I'm talking about there. But anyways, so if you, here's the reason why we don't necessarily want to have too big of a signal, though. Let's say I doubled the, the amount of material that was in the path of the light, okay? Now, this doesn't usually happen with an ATR, but let's say it hap you, you happen to somehow double the amount of material. What would happen to the peaks? They would get bigger, right? Now, bigger means bigger down, right? So then what happens is it would look like this. Well, maybe not quite that high, but something like that. And then you... Down over on this end, all you would have is this. And you can't get any useful information out of it. So be aware of when you're doing your spectra and you're looking at spectra, a good spectrum doesn't go all the way to zero. It gets close, but doesn't always hit zero. These peaks that are really sharp over here almost never show up if you have too much stuff because they're just smashed to the bottom of the screen. Okay? If that makes sense? Yeah. Just technique stuff. The other thing that we plot, and we've talked about this in lab, is the wave numbers down here. And that's the symbol for the wave numbers. And it's just the number of waves per centimeter. So on the 400 end, that's literally, there's in a centimeter, you can fit 400 waves. And in a centimeter, you can get 4,000 waves. 
Now, 4,000 waves in terms of energy versus 400 waves, which is higher in energy? 4,000, because it's a higher frequency. There's more waves in a given amount of space, right? And, this, and you have to remember, light waves are traveling at a constant rate, so you have more waves per centimeter relates to, because of a constant velocity, relates to higher frequency and higher energy. So this is the high energy end. And this is the low energy end, okay? Now, when you go to find peaks, most people, well, okay, lots of people don't talk about putting lines on the graph. They just, they just say these are where the peaks are. But literally, when you analyze IR spectra, um, you don't always have the numbers on the peaks. Like in the problems for like the homework, there won't be numbers on the peaks. So what you do is you take a ruler and you just draw lines on there so you can find peaks easily and estimate where they're at. So you have to get really good at analog. You know what analog is? What's digital? Digital, I give you numbers, right? Analog is you try to estimate the numbers based on where something is. So you've got to get really good at analog. So how do you do that? Well, there's a peak here, right? And this is 1,500. This is 1,400. This peak is about, what, 80% of the way? So 480 would be a good estimate, or sorry, 1480 would be a good estimate of what that is. And this one may be 1380 because it's just about the same distance that way, right? Um, <clears throat> in lab, you can always find the peaks and it always tells you. So you, could, you don't have to be so good at analog. But when you get problems on a test, I'm not going to give you like, oh, that's where that peak is. Part of the reason is because I don't want you to fixate on the number. Because the number changes a little bit, okay? If you get all fixated on the number, you'll be like, well, he said it was 1485, but this is 1480. This can't be it. That's like five parts, right, and, and 1500. That's like meaningless, right? But people will do that. They'll fixate on that little bit of a difference. So I want you, again, like when you look at your dog, you're not saying, that hair's out of place. That is not my dog, Right? You say, oh, it likes me. It wants to sniff me. It must be my dog. You don't think about all those details. Uh, these turned out to be 1380 and 1470s. Now I gave you the numbers. I know, fixating. But, uh, but the lines that I told you, okay, these are all very practical lines to put. And you will, over time, find where you want to put lines, depending on what kind of compound you have. Okay? All right. And I'll explain to you what some of these different things are. And again, I talked about how you describe these things in terms of their intensity and their shape. They're strong, medium, weak for intensity. Um, strong is what? Huh? Lower, yeah. And weak is higher, and medium is in the middle. What's the middle? Is this one medium? For sure that's medium. What about this one? Yes. And this one? And this is where people get crazy. Well, that one's medium weak. <laughs> I don't care. It's not that important. Okay. Part of that, again, depends on... Turns out these peaks, if there's lots of a functional group, the peak for that functional group will be really big. It's actually the size of the signal will be proportional to the number of that functional group. Okay. Um, so, if I had a lot of OHs on here, this one that's right around, sorry, this ones that are right around 1100 would be really big, okay? So, I'll explain that to you later. This, is, this would be enormous as well. That's a single o, OH stretch, and this is actually a CO stretch, okay? We'll talk about why we find things in different places in a bit. Okay, but, yeah. Based on what functional groups you're looking for, you'll place lines on there and then try to estimate, like, oh, I've got, a, I've got a peak near the line that I'm expecting, so what is that wave number? And you'll just write it down. Okay, so these are things that affect peaks. The wave number is affected by two things, and we'll go into the details of those. But basically, think about it like this. Let's say I had 
And if you haven't had physics, oh shoot. If you hadn't had physics, maybe this doesn't make a lot of sense, but we'll try to make it make some sense. Let's say I have a weight. It's one kilogram. And I put it on a spring. That, that's a spring. <laughs> it's a mushroom with a really tall stalk. And then I make this thing start vibrating this way. Okay? It's going to have a period to it. That is, it's going to go... And it's a spring, so it makes that noise. Right? Make the stock the same. So the stock, sorry, the spring, same. Now I have a much smaller mass. Let's say I have a tenth of a kilogram. What happens to the period? Higher or lower? Now just think common experience, right? Think about things that you've seen. If you take something that has springiness to it, and has a bigger mass, does it go faster or does it go slower? Bigger mass goes slower. So smaller mass must be faster. So it turns out a smaller mass will make the spring vibrate more quickly. Now, in a molecule, it's a little weird because the way I've drawn this, it's fixed on a surface, right? And a molecule, <clears throat> it has two ends, and both ends are atoms, right? And so it's the relative mass of, it's the mass of the two objects that determines, in part, what the frequency of the vibration will be. Okay? Big, big atoms will vibrate at low frequencies. Small atoms will, will vibrate at high frequencies. So that relates to, in terms of wave numbers, small masses are at high wave numbers, okay? like 4,000 n, and big masses are at low wave numbers, like the 400 n, more towards that end. And it's going to be, there's, it's actually proportional to something we call the, the reduced mass. And I'll show you the, the equation. And I just did the calculations for you. You don't have to do the calculations. I just want to show you how it works, okay? So that's one thing that affects um, the vibration is this thing we call the reduced mass effect, or it's the mass of the atoms. The other thing is how strong the bond is, okay? So maybe you don't have the experience for this one, but if you take something that has a very strong spring on it and you try to bend it and let it go, right? What happens, how does it vibrate, the strong spring? Does it vibrate slowly? Yeah, think about it like this. If you had a really weak spring, right, or a really weak rubber band and you stretched a weight on it and you let go of it, it would go at a certain frequency. But if you make the rubber band stronger, it'll start out higher, right? And then when you go like this, it'll go a lot faster. So it turns out the bond strength directly relates to also where it shows up in the spectrum. Stronger bonds will always be to the higher wave number in. So if you have a double bonded carbon versus a single bonded carbon, not that you'd look for those, by the way. You don't usually look for single bonded carbons. Why don't you usually care about single bonded carbons in determining a structure? Because there's a crap load of single bonded carbon. <laughs> right? Carbon, carbon, single bond, they're all over the place. So you're like, eh, I don't care about those. Double bonds, you would worry about a little bit. But in terms of general properties, on the right-hand side of your spectrum is where you expect to find single bonds. On the left-hand side of your spectrum, you expect to find higher order bonds, like double and triple bonds. And I'll show you where you expect to find those things based on equations and stuff, and based on a common experience. OK. Delocalization also affects, and we'll, we're going to go into all these things in more detail, but I just want you to get the idea. Delocalization also affects where it shows up, okay? And not always in the way you, maybe you predict, but we'll get into that when we get into it. The other thing is the amplitude. And I never quite find the right slides for these things. I try to make my own. I have struggled over how to explain this stuff many, many times. So hopefully this will be okay. But the dipole and its polarizability matter. And you have to think about, too, when two objects are connected to each other, right? And they're ex ex absorbing, that bond has to absorb electromagnetic radiation, right? Can something that's not magnetic absorb magnetic wave, right? 
can something that doesn't have a charge on it be affected by an electromagnetic wave? And the answer is not very much. Okay, a little bit. So typically what we see in infrared spectroscopy is that bonds that are affected the most are the ones that are polar or polarizable, okay? Just because they have to be able to interact with the electromagnetic field, and if they're nonpolar, you don't see them. They're going to be almost invisible, like tiny, tiny peaks, okay? So while we talked about position, we talked about amplitude, and I'll go into more details, and then shape it has to do with hydrogen bonding, and I'll explain that when I get to it. But basically, because of hydrogen bonding interactions, peaks tend to be really broad that are hydrogen bonded. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the mass effect. This is the equation. Yay. That's the way. Just remember, these are two things you have to look at on this. Okay. The first one is that's the frequency, right? That's the wave numbers that I just circled. The second thing that you have to notice is this. That's the force constant. That's related to the bond strength between the two atoms. Stronger bonds, bigger force constant. It's the force of attraction. Lower, right? And this is the equation, by the way, for the os oscillation in this direction, what we call stretching. Okay? But they're all roughly related to these terms, if I remember right. And then there's this thing called the reduced mass, and the reduced mass is this. It's the mass of the first atom times the mass of the second atom divided by the mass of the first atom plus the mass of the second atom. So let's say you're looking at hydrogen and hydrogen. Okay. This would be one. That would be one. That would be one. And that would be one, so it would be half. Okay. But if it was carbon and hydrogen, notice one of the masses got really big, then it's close to one. If the masses get even bigger, and now what I did, this is deuterium, okay? It's gotten even bigger. And then when you have like carbon and nitrogen or carbon and oxygen, these things are relatively large. Now these are in the bottom term. The reduced mass is in the bottom term, and it's square rooted, okay? So, but it doesn't really matter so much as square rooted for what we're talking about. It's in the bottom. So when this number gets big, what happens to the frequency? What happens to this? Goes up or down? Down, right? That means it's shifted to the right. This is confirmation of the idea, right, that as you have heavier masses bonded together, the frequencies will be on the right. It is actually quantitative, though. You can actually predict. It's based on the square root of the mass. So if you have a compound that has hydrogen in it and you want to know where that hydrogen is and you can synthetically replace it with the deuterium, the peak will shift according to the ratio of the reduced masses to the square root. It turns out the square root, if you take the, the, the ratio of these two and you take the square root, it's going to be 1.41, it's that square root of 2 thing, shifted over. So it's going to be shifted over about 40%. So if you have an alcohol and you have a hydrogen on it and you think, oh, is that an alcohol or is that something else? Now, nobody would do this with an alcohol and IR because everybody sees the IR of the alcohol and says, that's my dog. Okay. But if you put a deuterium on it, it shifts 40% of the screen over to the right. Okay. So it will shift 40%. And that's one of the ways you can tell where, like, if a particular hydrogen that you, you put there is in a particular place. You can just see where the IR shifts to. Okay. Um, it's also, uh, the frequency is also related to the square root of the force constant, okay? Um, so if the, if the masses are about the same between two different functional groups, like carbon and oxygen, right, and carbon and nitrogen, and the reduced mass is roughly the same, you expect to find those signals in the same range, okay? You can't just say, oh, well, 
This number is bigger, so CO will be at a lower frequency than CN because the bond strengths are a little bit different, okay? So you can't just like flat out and just say, oh, it's going to be this much different for these ones because the bond strengths are different. We can do that with deuterium and hydrogen because the bond strength is about the same, okay? Okay, so this is where you expect just plugging numbers into these calculations, and this is from your book, and I, I think they probably just looked on the spectra and said this is where you expect to find them. I don't think they actually went through the trouble to calculate them. CH single bonds, right? We find them around 3,000. CD, which you're probably not going to encounter very much, is 2,200. CO, 1,100. That's a single bond, and that's a stretch. And CCL, this is our friend for methylene chloride. It's 735-ish that we see. This is where you expect to find CCL. Right. What do you notice? Mass gets bigger, peaks shift further to the right because the reduced mass effect gets larger and larger and larger. Okay? If you look at CN triple bonds versus double bonds versus single bonds, what do you notice? Which one's furthest to the left? Triple bond because stronger bonds tend to vibrate at higher frequencies. Okay? Okay, schematically, this is a fairly useful uh, diagram. It's not great, but it's useful. Uh, single bonds are all in this region, okay? And I'll talk about what that means in a second. Double bonds are typically in this region. <clears throat> Triple bonds are 2,300 to 2,100. And then uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, to hydrogen are all out here, typically past 3,000, okay? So once you get a feel for where these different functional groups are, okay, when you go to report these things in lab reports, one of the things that I'll expect that you do, or if you're analyzing problems from the book, or if you're turning in an exam that has analyzed this IR spectrum, I expect that it'll be in this format, okay? You're going to, for an IR spectrum like this one, identify where you see the peaks, identify what they look like in terms of how big they are and whether they're broad or sharp, okay? And what the assignment is. best way to get good at this is just practice. That's why I didn't, like any of the problems with subparts, I didn't leave out any subparts. It's just like you do them all. When you do it, you will have a correlation table that lists out a bunch. A correlation table gives you functional groups and where you expect to find their peaks and what these peaks are supposed to look like. Okay, But there are lots of peaks that have the same wave numbers. It's not a practical thing to have a correlation table necessarily on a test because you're going to get more confusion by seeing so many functional groups that have the same number and weight appearance. It's better to go based on your experience in looking at spectra. Okay. All right. I think I got a disconnect here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so hybridization effects where you expect to find the stretch for a bond. So sp3, sp2, and sp, right? Which is shortest. And we're looking at these bonds here. Which of these bonds is the shortest. Which one? SP. SP is the shortest because it's more S character. The orbitals are more S-like, which means they're closer to the nucleus. They're shorter. So that means which one's the strongest bond? The SP, right? So this one's stronger. Okay, so if you focus in on the region of the spectrum where you expect to find CHs, CHs, where do we find them? Ballpark? 
3,000. All right, 2,800 to 3,000. That's where we expect to find CH stretches. That's from, like, well, actually, this one here. Around, we expect to find them around 3,000. For a spectrum, like this one, these are the CH stretches. Okay. Now, this is for uh, 2-butanol. Uh, it's an alcohol with an OH at the second carbon. But... Um, this is a relatively strong peak. Why are the CHs so strong? Because in organic compounds, we have lots of CH bonds. And look at the top. See how sharp those are? So I tend to call this strong and sharp, but it's a whole series of peaks in a range. It's not just one functional group. There's many CH types within that uh, giant peak that we're seeing. That's where we expect to find, these were sp3, around 3,000. So that means these should be progressively to higher wave numbers because the bonds get stronger. Okay. So this is what it looks like. Alkanes, this is just that region around 3,000 and 2,800. Okay. You notice how cleanly it hits that line. This is why one of the lines I always recommend students draw is that line at 3,000. Okay. You guys did eugenol this week, right? It has a double bond in it. It has sp hybridized CH bonds. So what you should expect to see, if you look on your spectrum closely, is you should expect to see this peak here. It may not be very big, okay? But you should expect to see a peak to the left, we would say to the left of 3,000. And that's actually the CH stretch for an alkene. And if it's an alkyne, it's all the way out here around 3,200, 3,300. Okay. You see how far out that shifts, right? So that's how you identify alkanes from alkenes versus alkynes. Um, so let's look at this. It's Is it possible to have an alkene or alkyne, all right, that doesn't have a signal above 3,000? That's a double bond or a triple bond. A 3,000 is what kind of stretch? CH, right? So if it doesn't have a CH on the double bond or a CH on the triple bond, then, of course, it's not going to have that stretch above 3,000. Structures like this one, what do you expect about this one? Peak above 3,000, not above 3,000. What's that? Above. above. It'll have one because on this carbon, sorry, got an H, all right. What about this one? No, because these are, there's no hydrogens on it, right? So this one's a... Yes, no. And the one on the right? Peak above? No peaks above 3,000. Because this is a CH3. People do that all the time. They think it's a, they think, oh, it's a hydrogen. Oh, yeah, of course it'll have one. It's, a, it says carbon, so you actually won't see it. And in fact, this, this triple bond very likely won't show up very strongly just because uh, it doesn't have a dipole. And this one will probably not be so strong. Okay. So it turns out resonance can affect where a peak shows up. Okay. So a ketone, this is a ketone, we usually see it around 1700, 1720. Um, has two resonance contributors. What do you know about the relative stabilities of those contributors? Are they the same? <clears throat> no. M why not? Carbon doesn't have its octet anymore. And now you have this charge, right, of separation. But primarily, you don't have the octet. That's the big deal. 
So the molecule, for the most of the time, spends its time like this, okay? So we can take 1720 as like a marker for where we expect to see ketones that don't really have much resonance in them. Now, let's do this. I'm going to change the structure. And I'm going to put a double bond there. Okay. Oh, I can't see the O very well, can you? Now it can have a couple of resonance structures. One is this goes up here. Oops. And the other one. The other important one, let's put it like that, has something like this. So that one's actually a little bit, they're a little more equivalent because you can delocalize the pair of electrons that are in the double bond, and delocalization leads to stability, right? So now you have a little bit of stabilization. But... The hybrid is going to look closer. It's still going to look like a double bond, right? But it's going to have a lot of single bond character to it now. A lot more so than this one does, simply because it can delocalize that pi bond. So if you're thinking about bond strength, right? If you're a double bond, let's call you a certain strength, okay? What if you're a combination of a double and a single? Are you stronger or weaker? You're weaker now. So which way is that going to shift your peak? To the right, to the longer, uh, the longer wavelength or the lower energy side, right? So actually, if you look at it, and you take 1,700, okay, as your benchmark, 1,720 is your benchmark, and now you have conjugation, it's shifted over about 40 wave numbers. So that's a, actually a significant distance on the spectrum. Now, I'll tell you, if you don't draw the lines that they tell you to draw, you're going to look at it and go, it looks the same, <laughs> right? Those lines help you see how far things have moved in a structure from where you expect to find them. So when I look at these spectra for these two kinds of compounds and I don't draw lines on them, I look at them and go, they're the same. What am I looking at? And then I have to take the time to draw lines on them. I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert in IR interpretation. I'm just functional, right? So, like, I can walk, but I can't, like, run, if that's a good analogy. I'm not crawling on the ground with bleeding knees, but, uh, yeah, I would not call myself an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Look what happens to an ester, All right? Remember, where, where did we find... Um, where did we find our ester in uh, banana oil? We found a CO stretch. You guys remember? For almost everybody, it was around 1735. Okay. Again, that uh, shifted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot to talk about that. Dang it. from this one, I'll have to explain something here. And then this one, right, is also shifted from this one. And again, it's about the same distance as this is shifted from this. Um, yeah, I left a slide out. I knew this was gonna happen. Okay, this is what happens, I rewrote these, right, every year, because it bothers me every year, and then there's always something I'm like, oh, I should point this out. Okay, I'm gonna point something out, I'm gonna make a slide and hopefully remind myself later to talk about it. Okay. So we've kind of in agreement. We expect to find that one at 1720, okay? Right, that's where we've seen it before. When I put it, a strongly electronegative group on that. 
turns out the peak okay, tends to shift to higher energies. The C double bond O shifts to higher waves numbers. What does that mean? That it shifted to higher wave numbers? Shifted to the left, right? What does it tell us about the bond strength? It got weaker, it's got stronger, right? So think about this. What does the resonance look like for this? The resonance for this looks exactly like what we had before. Right? This is just like if I had put the methyl, if the CL was a methyl group instead. It's exactly what I had before. So what, what the shift to higher wave numbers is telling us in this instance, okay, is that the contributor, this contributor, is even less a part of the hybrid. And that makes the bond stronger. So but why is this contributor less likely to form? Or less of the total, you know, hybrid? It's an inductive effect. The chlorine is electronegative, right? So it's going to put a partial negative there and a partial positive there. That actually makes it less stable and makes the double bond stronger because it's more double bond-like. That makes sense. Kind of a weird way to think about it. So putting an electronegative group on there actually has two possible effects. Okay? One, though, the general one is it shifts it to higher wave numbers. Now, if that group is really good at donating electrons, then it shifts to lower wave numbers. Okay, so it just depends on the type of group. Maybe we'll have time to talk about this later when we talk about um, aromatic reactions, which are actually in the next semester. So. Just leave it to, right now, this, the strong electronegative groups create an inductive effect, put a positive charge on that carbon, cause it to be less stable as a resonant structure. This bottom one is less stable as a resonant structure. And as a result, it's more double bond-like and less single bond-like. And that shifts it to higher wave numbers. Right? Okay, so... Um, Just some things to look at or look for. These are those lines that I was telling you about to put onto your screen, right? Um, around 3,000, it divides the space. These are important things to keep track of. De define, divides the space between sp3 and other CH bond hybridizations. So you can see double bonds and triple bonds really good. Okay, so that's alkenes and alkynes. It also divides the space because to the left of of 3,000 is where we find alcohols and amines, okay? <clears throat> and then I put a little more information. For amines, you usually find a peak around 3,400, and you also usually see a peak around 1,100 and about 1,600. So there's actually three peaks that you look for for amines, but there's a really easy way generally to see if you have an amine, so I'll get to that, okay? Especially primary amines. If you, have, um, if you ha think you have an alkyne, like a CN triple bond uh, here, expect to peak around 3,000. Around 2,000, 2,100, you expect to find a triple bond. And if it's a nitrile, you'll have, which is a CN triple bond, okay, you expect to find a peak at 2,250. Now, those are pretty close. Not exactly the same. You should be able to tell the difference from the, uh, between them. 
What's the thing that's really going to tell you the difference between this <coughs> functional group and this functional group? At least for terminal alkynes. <coughs> terminal alkyne will have this peak. <coughs> and nitriles, right? The way a nitrile terminates terminates like this. It's not going to have a hydrogen. Okay? It's just going to have the lone pair. So you won't see a peak. If it had one, it would probably be out around 3,200. And you'd see, and the nitrile would show up as well. But since it doesn't, if you have a nitrile, you, it's not, you can tell it's on a terminal alkyne just by the fact it doesn't have the peak out at the three, past 3,000. Um, let's see. 1,700 is, uh, the highlights for, is the highlight space for uh, carbonyl groups, C double bond O's. And there's all kinds of carbonyls, right? Aldehyde and ketones are around 1,720. Conjugation pushes it to the right, right? That is, delocalization pushes it to the right. Electron withdrawing groups or ring strain actually turns out pushing it to the left. And then uh, a CC double bond is usually a medium or weak peak, and it's usually around 1650. So these are just some things, like when you get your spectrum. Like this week, right, you have, um, I can't quite remember the functional group, uh, the functional group order for eugenol, but it's something like, um, like that. You've got all these functional groups on your spectrum, and now you should be able to go through and pick those things out, okay? Okay. Uh, I included this, and I know it's from Wikipedia, and people poo-poo it all the time, but it is a pretty nice table. Um, your lab book has a pretty nice table in it, too. Your textbook, I don't think, has a very good one. Um, but if you have double-bonded uh, carbon-oxygen double bonds, these are where you expect to find the different kinds of functional groups. Um, an acyl halide was what I was just talking about earlier. That's a functional group that looks like this. Oops. That's an acyl chloride. And you'll notice where you expect to find acyl halides, typically a little higher wave number. But you notice amides are shifted to the right of the 1720 mark. Okay. That's because nitrogen, an amide, is this. And this pair of electrons is a really good electron donator. So that gives that C double bond O a lot of single bond character as it goes through its resonance structure. So they're usually shifted to the right. Okay. Um, IR strength uh, signals vary by strength, like how big they are. So we say weak, strong. Some people say medium, weak. Some people say, I don't know, they make up all these combinations, medium, strong. It doesn't, like, it's just, I tell people, write medium, strong, and see what people say. Or medium, or strong, weak. Say strong, weak, and see what people say. They'll be like, that's medium, isn't it? Well, not my medium. Uh, you make stuff up. Just say medium, weak, and strong. Don't get all fancy. So um, that's supposed to be an electromagnetic wave propagating through space. This is the electric field. Okay. This is distance or length or space, whatever you want to call it. And this is a carbonyl floating in space, right? If it has a negative end and a positive end, and this is the positive end of the field and this is the negative end of the field, as that wave moves through the functional group, that's when you pick up a signal, okay? Because what's going to happen is as this field oscillates around this functional group, Right. it's going to begin to pick up that electromagnetic radiation oscillate. If you had a CC single bond, 
you're not going to see it. Especially if it's like ethane, perfectly symmetric, and it doesn't have a dipole. As the electromagnetic field goes through it, it won't pick it up. Now, if it's really polarizable, then you will see something. Polarizable, large things, pi bonds, ring systems, things like like benzene will show up in an IR. Well, it's pretty nonpolar, but it has these big pi electron clouds that can be polarized, and so those things can be picked up. So conjugated things can be picked up. Okay. The signal size, though, is going to depend on the strength of the dipole and whether or not it's polarizable, and also the number of those groups that you have. This is why CHs are so big in the IR spectrum. Okay. So carbonyls give us big stretches, you know, strong, because they pick up the electromagnetic. This is the change in the dipole as, sorry, this represents, oh, there it is. That represents the change in the dipole as the electromagnetic field goes through that functional group. That'll be large. We'll pick that up. And this will be small. This is, notice the oxygen's missing, so it's just a, uh, an alkene. Those will be relatively small. But it's still polarizable, actually, because it's not symmetric. So here's examples of COs versus CC double bonds. Right. They're both pretty sharp. Uh, this is sort of medium broad. Sorry, I hate to do that to you. Just thought I'd say it. But it's still pretty sharp at the end. This one's sharp, uh, but the size is much different, and that has strictly to do with the uh, polarizability or the dipole of the molecule. Okay. So it says 2, 3 at the very bottom left here. 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene does not give an IR signal in the region of 1,500 to 2,000. That's where you expect to find the double bond. That structure looks like this. Why doesn't it give a signal? It's very weak if it's there. It's because the molecule, nonpolar bond, it's perfectly symmetric. All right, and so it's not very polarizable in that respect. Okay, sometimes you get stronger signals for things when you have uh, multiple bonds of the, of the same type vibrating. But it turns out sometimes things, when they're conjugated, give us stronger signals than we expect as well. Okay, so the question is, like, why would you expect, oops, why would you expect this to give a relatively large CC double bond stretch? Well, then ask yourself the question, what kind of things give relatively large uh, signals? Things that are polar, right, or polarizable. And when you draw the resonance contributors for this, the primary one that you get, oops, the primary one that you get is this. Missing that. I think something. That's the primary resonance contributor that you get. And what does it do to the to the carbon on the far end? It puts a charge on it, right? That charge gets picked, that part of the molecule, because it has a charge distributed there, even though it's a CC double bond and the bond is nonpolar, in its resonance structure, it has a charge, and so it can pick up the electromagnetic radiation. Because okay? remember, the hybrid's going to have a partial charge there. So this is an alkene peak that's here. Now, scale it relative to this. This is the alkane peak, okay? This is what's a little bit tricky in understanding the spectrum. There's the alkane peak. There's the alkene peak, right around the 1600 we talked about. And relatively speaking, it's about 80% the height of that, right? And then here, this is the alkene peak here, and that's the alkane peak there. Now it's at least as big as it, right? The reason that is bigger 
It's more towards the medium strong side. God, I find myself do these things. Um, is because of the resonance that it has. And it's able to have a charge here. And then as the electromagnetic wave passes through it, it's able to pick up that radiation. Okay. Um, did I analyze this? Oh, yeah, let's just do one more thing. Put the lines on it because it's a lot easier to see that way. Um, you'll notice, too, here, see that? CH. CH, so it's picked up. That's that little kind of really sharp peak just to the left of the ring um, is what you see for a uh, CH stretch on an sp2 carbon. Okay, this is again, this is a carbonyl peak. This is the um, uh, CC double bond stretch. Okay, let's see here. What else do we have? what I want to talk about. It's much easier when I have this down on paper. Let's see, what is that about? This is 15, 16, this is around 1600. This is around 1650. Okay. So this peak, just by looking at it on the screen, I thought you might be able to see it a little bit better. Oh, I can actually see it here, okay. That's 1600. That's 1650. Okay, what does that tell us about the strength of the bonds? What's that? The bottom, looks the bottom looks stronger because it's at higher wave numbers, right? Why does it? Why is the bond strength change? Because that double bond is moving back and forth. It's part of a resonance structure, right? Resonance, a set of resonance structures, and so this top one has again this kind of contributor. That's a combination of single and double bond, right? So what happens to the bond? It gets weaker and it's shifted to the right, okay? So a lot of these little things you can pick up just by looking at a lot of, you only get it by looking at a lot of spectra. You can look at the tables of numbers all day long, you will not learn, trust me, not learn a thing. <laughs> but when you get a spectra in front of you, a handful like the ones I've assigned, and you just start analyzing them, that's when you'll start remembering where things are and what they look like, okay? Okay, uh, just a little bit about narrow and broad peaks, and then I'll be done. Uh, it comes out just about an hour. I just need to add a few slides, so it's good. Um, some IR signals are really narrow. Some are really broad. Okay. Think about it like this. If, it's a, if you're, if you're narrow-minded, okay, you only think of things being one way. Does that make sense? If you're narrow-minded, you only think of things one way. What does it mean to be broad-minded? You, you accept a wide range of information as being a possibility, right? And maybe you become narrow-minded on a subject, but usually broad-minded people keep a big open mind and then from that information produce a result. But anyways, anyway, back up for a second. Back to the original analogy. If a narrow signal means one type of resonance structure or bond structure... What does a broad peak mean? All kinds of structures or bond strengths. The width of the peak implies variation in strength of the bond. Okay, now how can that be? Right, because like we're all used to thinking OH is OH, right? How does the bond strength vary? Okay, so let me give you a brief. Uh, synopsis here. It's actually on the next slide, so I'll just base it on this slide. Alcohols and amines can all hydrogen bond, okay? Now, we usually think about, oh, hydrogen bonding, strong intermolecular force. That's the thing, the first thing that comes to our mind. 
But the other thing to think about, okay, is when this hydrogen, hydrogen bonds to this oxygen, it begins to, as it begins to approach this molecule, this bond actually begins weakening. I, the analogy I've used for this before, and hope this is not too offensive, it's like when you're dating, and you are dating one person, and you are single-minded, and that's all you see, and then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, look at that. There's another person in the world. What happens to your bond between you and that person that you were originally bonded to? It begins to get weak, unless you have... You know, anyway, sorry. Maybe it doesn't happen that way. But, but that's kind of a funny analogy. It's a funny way to think about when you're dating, right? I'm not dating anymore, thank you very much. 25 years. And now she works with me, so I have to be really careful about what I say. I say all kinds of crazy... I used to say all kinds of crazy stuff about me and her. But uh, now people can ask her, did he really say this to you when you were in college? All right. Yeah, so that bond gets weaker as this bond gets stronger or gets closer. So what that means, right, wide variation in strength of the bond. Wide variation in the strength of the bond, wide variation in peak width. Right. Anything that hydrogen bonds or interacts strongly with something else, that it strongly means starts to form a bond with something else, will have a broad peak for one of its stretches. Okay. So for an alcohol that looks like this, okay, that's the broad alcohol peak. Now, it turns out if you can dilute down the alcohol functional, functional group a lot or not allow it to hydrogen bond, sometimes that's done by diluting it down into a solvent so the concentration is really low. Then what happens is, you, instead of getting this big, broad peak, which we call the hydrogen bonding peak, you get this, what we call, free OH peak, where it's no longer hydrogen bonding. And the thing that you'll notice about the free OH peak is it's very sharp. Because when it's not hydrogen bonding, right, it's going to be one bond strength versus having that broad range of bond strengths. Now, I think only one of you knows this in this class. Carboxylic acids, you remember this from lecture? <laughs> Carboxylic acids can hydrogen bond twice. That is, the O can bond to the H, and then this O can bond to this H, and they form what these, they call these carboxylic acid dimers in solution. Okay, what does that do? Look at the peak for the OH on a carboxylic acid. It starts here around 3,400, and then it just goes forever. It's like 2,500, right? This is like the ugly one. It's so ugly that it's like, oh, that's nice. I know what that is, <laughs> right? If you get a carboxylic acid, instead of like the ester that you're looking for, you'll be looking at this and me going, oh, I got a carboxylic acid because it is obscuring everything on the left-hand side of the spectrum. And this one is, what, again, what I mean by, you know, if this was your pet, right, you would just look at it and say, oh, that's my pet. You don't say, it's a dog, and it has two eyes and a nose and a mouth and it wags its tail and eats food and poops. You don't say any of that. You just know it's your dog. If you have a carboxylic acid, this is your dog right here. It has all the other peaks, too. Like, uh, this is a CO peak, probably. Uh, there's probably a... CH2 and some CH3s in there, but nobody's going to look at this when they see this. All right? They're just going to say that's what it is. Okay. All right. Let's see. Mm, don't feel like doing that slide, honestly. Pretty tired. We're out of time. Okay, so um, I just want to do one more thing. This is what an amine looks like. And this gives me an opportunity to talk to you about other kinds of stretching modes. I haven't talked about it. People will make a big deal out of it, and it's kind of important, but I don't think you really need it unless you go to more advanced spectroscopy other than this one topic. Okay. 
Uh, and it has to do, again, we're talking about IR signal strength. This is for means, and O and N are about the same size. So an OH bond and an NH bond are about the same strength. They're going to have about the same frequency. Okay? So when you look at where the NH shows up, this is an NH, and this is also an NH. Okay? And they're around the same place that you see an alcohol. But what do you notice is different? There's something that's really significantly different, and then there's some general things. Compared to an OH, sorry, compared to an OH. Go back to an OH. That's an OH. That's an OH, right? On the far left. What is weird about here? You got two fairly significant peaks, and they're relatively not large. They're like medium size, right? relative to the, uh, the, uh, this part. That, in part, is due because there's a lot of carbons, but it also has to do with stretching modes. Let me get this, see if this makes sense to you. So, on a, okay, I have NH2. Okay. OH is this, and how can OH stretch? Like this, right? That's one stretching mode. That's it. Now I'm NH2. I'm like this. So I can go like this, okay? Or I could go like this. And those are slightly different energies, and they give you two different peaks. So one is, like, again, like this. One's like this. There's actually, in the spectrum, and you can look these things up, because I'm sure there's lots of funny people demonstrating these things. There are things that we call scissoring. This, right? Did you notice how many peaks that were on the right-hand side of the screen? This is scissoring, OK? This is wagging. This is out of plane bending. And all of these are quantized energy levels. And when, you, when a molecule absorbs energy, each one of those can produce a peak. Where we see most of them, OK? Let me see if I can do this real quick. I just need a IR spectrum. I don't have a complete IR spectrum. That's horrible. And where we see most of those kind of funny stretches are down in here. So a lot of people don't spend much time analyzing this region until they've analyzed this region above about 1,400. You look at the 1,400 range, and then you look for verification below. But most of us will use a table or something to say, oh, I have this functional group. I expect bends of these types and scissors and rocky. I expect to find these way over here somewhere. And then you look for a couple of peaks to help you verify. But again, that's only when you have an unknown, right? If you know what you're looking for, you look for the major peaks and you identify those. So if you took my finger, I'm just tell you what these regions are called now. Uh, if I took my finger and gave you a fingerprint, okay, and then everybody did that, and then we had somebody perpetrate a crime, and we had the one fingerprint to look at, could you identify the person when you look at their fingerprint? by itself? No, only when you compare it to other fingerprints, right? You can't, you can't take my thumbprint if you had a whole room full of thumbprints. If you don't know it's mine, you can't look at my thumbprint and say, oh, that's obviously Dr. K, because that thumbprint says Dr. K on it somewhere, right? So we call this region on the right the fingerprint region. We can identify a molecule based on its fingerprint if we already have a spectrum. It turns out there's so much information in there that if you have a large enough library, and actually we do have a huge library uh, on our, our spectrometer, infrared spectrometer, you can identify lots of unknown compounds just by looking in the fingerprint region. Now, here's the beauty. You don't look in the fingerprint region. The computer does. It matches the peak intensities and the relative heights and the positions and uses that information to identify what the compound is. On the left-hand side, this is known as the diagnostic region. So I don't know, you know, people give you different ranges. I would say, <clears throat> depending on whether or not you want to analyze the peaks at 1,400 or not, 1,500 and higher, or 1,400 and higher, or 1,300 and higher. But everything to the left of about 1,300 is known as the diagnostic region. I find that term to be entirely not useful. The older term for it is the functional group region. Because when you look in this part from about 1,400 on, and you see a peak, you know what functional group you have. Okay. All right. Any questions? That's kind of the 
Okay, so that I'm done with that lecture, so the IR homework is due on Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. And the homework is at the beginning of the slides, and they've been posted for a while, so that's a one-day chapter.